Hi everybody, my name is Mike Ryan, and uh, we're talking to you today about reverse engineering the Nintendo 64 SICK. A little bit about us. Uh, I really like to play video games. My name is Marshall, and uh, I've had a lot of interest in Nintendo 64 specifically for a long time, so it's been really great that these two people have helped me make it happen. I'm just a video game enthusiast. <laughs> this guy's the PM. He's taking all the credit, though. Hi, my name is John McMaster. I run siliconprawn.org and am a general hardware enthusiast and like working with computer chips. All right, so before we get too into the technical content of what we're talking about today, I want to give you guys a little brief history of uh, the video game industry and the motivations that, and the forces that led to the creation of the SICK. So back in the early 1980s, Atari was a very popular video game company. Uh, they released some very excellent games. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Pong and and uh, Nintendo's original Donkey Kong. Uh, and everything was going really well for them until around 1983 or so when the market became flooded with just absolute garbage games. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with the story of uh, E.T. Uh, a whole bunch of cartridges ended up in a landfill somewhere out in New Mexico. Uh, a lot of us thought this was an apocryphal story. So there was an art project last year that went out and exhumed some of those. And it turns out that, yes, indeed, the landfill was absolutely loaded with trash games. And this did not work out well for Atari or for the home video game market. You can see it takes a major dive starting around 1983. And then at 1986, uh, the very bottom of the market was everybody had thought the video game industry was dead. Meanwhile, Nintendo was having massive success in Japan with their Famicom, and they wanted to bring it to the United States. Uh, Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president of Nintendo, believed that Atari failed because they allowed anybody and everybody to publish games for their platform. They didn't do any quality control whatsoever. So he believed that there had to be some sort of a technical mitigation for this, a technical uh, means of preventing people from making unauthorized games for the system. And it really all boiled down to this. So when you went out to the market, if you were a kid in the 80s, and you bought a Nintendo game, and it had this seal on it, you were reasonably sure that you were getting a pretty good game. So the technical means by which Nintendo accomplished this was the SICK. Now, what the SICK is, is part of a system to basically enforce licensing from, directly from Nintendo. So what happens is, uh, it's like you have a SICK chip in the console, and then one in the game, and then they talk to each other when you start the game. So they're always talking uh, just constantly so that if anything happens, uh, it just resets itself. And anyone who has an NES knows they are very, very, very flaky. This is one of the reasons. Uh, because of the bad cartridge connector, it usually wouldn't make good contact. And for the Super Nintendo, it was pretty much the same story. Uh, they just took the same chip, they shrunk it down a little bit, problem solved. So there's not much difference there. Now, there were pirate games for the NES, and there's a couple of ways that they did this. It was pretty uh, interesting, I think. The, the, top picture, the picture on the top there is part of the game circuit board, and there is no lockout chip. Instead, there is a boost regulator, which is just a circuit that generates very large negative spike voltage. And it goes, and then it, instead of talking to the chip, it just punches it in the mouth and then <laughs> shuts it up. <laughs> wow. So it's it definitely not kosher. It did work. Uh, sometimes, some of the times, it just kills your console. Nintendo actually released a console revision that had some uh, inline resistors that, that, uh, that prevented this. And some of these game manufacturers actually sent out manuals that said how to open up your console and clip the pin on the SICK that enabled it. That's how desperate these companies were to make games for this system. Right, because the licensing costs were very uh, prohibitive. You could make money, but you did have to work very hard for it. And on the bottom is a actual clone made by Tengen, uh, which is actually Atari. They just made a shell company so that they could sneakily get away with stuff like this. So this is actually a pretty interesting story. I'm, I'm, some of the people in this room might be familiar with it. So at the time, uh, Nintendo, uh, sorry, Atari was attempting to reverse engineer this chip using invasive chip methods. So they tried to get inside the die package and uh, remove the die and then figure out how the chip worked. In the meantime, 
uh, somebody inside Atari decided to go to the copyright office and file a bogus copyright claim to get the source code to Nintendo's original 10 NES chip, and then they produced a perfectly functional clone using this. This is pretty illegal, and Nintendo sued them for that, and Atari ended up having to pay them a whole bunch of money. However, the interesting outcome of this lawsuit was that one of the district court judges noted that the reverse engineering process, assuming Atari had not stolen the code, actually qualifies as a fair use. So we've got a pretty rock-solid case here that what we're doing is fair use under copyright law. <laughs> right, so hey, let's just skip to Nintendo 64 now. We're done with all that older stuff. Now, they basically took the same system that worked for them on the older stuff, and they tweaked it a little bit, modernized it just slightly, just enough for it to be different. And then, so here's a Bach diagram of the N64. I'm not going to talk about how it does the game graphics and stuff like that. What's inside the yellow rectangle is the protection system. Uh, same deal. These two chips are talking to each other from the moment you turn the game on until you turn it off, always talking to each other. But instead of being uh, two symmetrical things, uh, you know, executing a lockstep, the PIF is just, they rolled it into a uh, chip that handles all the system bring up and pulling the controllers and the interrupts, the resets and all that sort of thing. So here's an actual game cartridge. This is a legitimate one. So the chip on the left is the lockout chip. It looks exactly the same. They're made by Sharp. It's just uh, the more modern iteration, I suppose. Um, now I should say, unlike the older Nintendo stuff, instead of having very widespread pirate chips, this uh, pirate game is actually very, very, very rare. Uh, if you actually have one of these and you're willing to uh, donate in the name of science, <laughs> we actually really like to see what's inside those. There, there's a, a very small number of pirate games made in Hong Kong that have this chip, and we have very little information about the history of this pirated sick. So again, please let us know if you have any leads on these. Continuing our talk about uh, dubious legality, uh, this is how you would pirate games. Basically, it has a bunch of RAM inside, this piece on the bottom, the top part is the N64, if you aren't familiar with it. It reads uh, games off CD drives, and then uh, it did not have any sort of way to emulate or copy the lockout chip. So what you had to do was, in the cartridge slot in the top, you would insert a real game, and it would connect just the lockout chip, so it would fool it into running. Uh, now, here are a couple flash cartridges that let you run homebrew and do uh, sorts of development on modern, uh, with modern technology. And, and really that's what this is all about. The SIC made sense perhaps 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when Nintendo actually was making considerable money off these consoles. But nowadays, we want to be able to do homebrew development and actually use them for interesting purposes. And the SIC is just getting in the way of what we consider a very reasonable use of the hardware. So not only ourselves, but earlier projects also started looking into cloning the earlier chips. Right. And if you were to take the lid off one of these uh, older protection chips, uh, we have these swapped around. This is actually the older NES and Super NES lockout chip. There ha this is basically showing you the existing efforts to clone them, which they have accomplished. And we haven't accomplished that for our current development tools for the Nintendo 64, which is what we're going to do in this talk. So that's what this talk is about. I'm not sure if we actually explained that in the beginning. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good job presenting, team. Yes. Uh, so unlike the older Nintendos, where they had one lockout chip for, you know, like six or seven years, uh, Nintendo got a little bit smarter, and throughout the lifespan of the console, they would periodically introduce new lockout chips just to stay ahead of the pirates by a few months so they'd have to, you know, figure the new secrets out. So there are six variants per region and then there are uh, NTSC, which is Americas, Japan, and some other things, and then the rest of the world, basically. So it made things, it made it much harder and more difficult to pirate. Uh, there were some special cases, like this is a arcade board, so it's a JAMA board that plugs into an arcade cabinet has a Nintendo chipset, and they just have the uh, the game plugs into some sort of custom connector, 
just to different, you know, a special case but of it, lockout the, chip. And yeah, this, this, even the arcade hardware had the same exact lockout chip. It's labeled as a 5101, but it's actually running identical code to the 6101 uh, NTSC chip. So at this point, we know what the chip does. We don't know how it does it. If you were to look at what the chip does physically, look with the logic analyzer or something, you will just see a stream of zeros and ones, and it's completely random. Uh, you can log it for days and days. It will never repeat. You don't know how it works. So what we did is we switched to, uh, we started to get to know John McMaster here for a little while, and uh, who's working with Andrew Zonenberg, who just gave a talk. What they do is they uh, use very dangerous chemicals, and they just get right in there onto the chip and then see exactly what's going on. So I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to explain exactly the mad science you use to look inside. Hey there. So uh, while these guys were cowering behind their laptops and their cubicles, I was out in the trenches getting my hands dirty. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what that involves and uh, what we got out of it. So Andrew is apparently going to get bored to death by this slide, but we're going to beat the dead horse a little bit, just with <laughs> one slide. Uh, so the first part of this process uh, for actually getting to the die and extracting information is to actually uh, open up the chip and expose it by removing the epoxy uh, that's basically blocking access to the chip. Unfortunately, at the time, I was having trouble getting uh, some of the chemicals that I wanted to use. So the very first step for me, which is shown on the left, is that I actually uh, distilled the uh, nitric acid that I wanted to use uh, to decap the chip. So once I got that, uh, we move over to the right. Uh, now, normally, the way that I would do this is maybe with a heat gun and a little small test tube just to decap one chip. Uh, as we'll see later, though, this process had some uh, issues where I had to kind of play around with it a little bit. So I'm actually decapping a bunch of chips at the same time. Uh, unfortunately, this reaction is very exothermic. That is, you know, puts off a lot of heat and uh, actually can explode if you uh, don't monitor it carefully. So uh, for here, I put it in a water bath, uh, and that kind of makes it, uh, keeps it under control and makes sure I don't have to get a new eye or something. <laughs> um, the other big problem, too, is if you notice, there's this uh, kind of red gas uh, building up in there. And uh, this red gas is uh, actually rather unpleasant to breathe. Uh, so the uh, second notable part of the setup, uh, which is kind of in the background there, is uh, there's some tubes that feed it through what's called a scrubber unit that actually makes it so very little of this uh, very red, unpleasant gas uh, gets released in this process. Once that done, that, once that completes, you get something that looks like this. I think this is some Xilinx uh, FPGA of sorts, but, you know, the same sort of idea. You get this uh, kind of tangled mess of bond wires and silicon, the bond wires being the uh, gold wires that connect uh, from the plastic package you're used to seeing on circuit boards down to the actual silicon die. Uh, this makes it difficult to clean. It makes it very unstable on microscope stages and leads to a number of other problems. So we really need a way to rip those suckers off and you know, just get the bare die. So the first way to, to do this, which is what a lot of people do, is actually just to take tweezers and you know, very carefully under a microscope uh, pull these guys off one by one. Uh, and that's what I did initially, and, you know, it works okay. Uh, but if you want to do a bunch of these, it really doesn't scale well, and it's just kind of a soul-crushing process. Uh, maybe soothing for some people. Uh, but you also can, uh, you know, risk scratching the die. You know, if your tweezer sw uh, slips, uh, you can, you know, gouge it and maybe crack the die in half if you're really sloppy. Uh, you know, just want to avoid that if possible. Uh, additionally, you know, this yanking process is pretty brutal, and you'll actually take chunks out of the die sometimes. Uh, not necessarily a problem, but it looks kind of ugly. So after uh, looking around a little bit, uh, I saw that there were a few other methods that people use for stuff like this. Uh, one of them is actually take mercury and, uh, you know, use that to uh, dissolve the gold on the dye, just like, you know, the gold miners would, would do. Uh, mercury, even by my standards, I decided, eh, I don't really want to deal with that if I don't have to. Uh, looked into it, and the hot solder seems to work just about as well. Not exactly the greatest chemical either, but a little bit better than mercury. So if you look on the left, you can see a uh, ball bond on a chip. And uh, on the right, after applying some solder to this, uh, what it's done is it's basically just dissolved the gold wire. We have the bond pad, which is a little bit uh, distorted from the uh, ball bonding process, which is a you know, kind of high pressure uh, mechanical process. But otherwise, we have basically a perfectly functional uh, bond pad, and it's very clean uh, the way it turns out. So once, once we get to this point, we've got a uh, bare die, and we need to start extracting information from it. So um, I looked into the market for getting a full computer-controlled microscope, 
And unfortunately, it's you know very expensive. So what I did instead was kind of hobbled something together from a bunch of pieces uh, collected uh, basically across the US. Uh, so the microscope body itself came from Craigslist. Uh, the motor controllers came from the school dumpsters. Uh, the laptop came from a surplus shop. Uh, and you know, the list kind of goes on. Everything's kind of hobbled together. And somehow it kind of managed to make a working system. Uh, basically, the way that it works is uh, there's a lamp house which shines light onto the die. The objectives you know, actually do the magnification. And then the uh, motors uh, go through an ARM processor that I wrote some very crude uh, but effective uh, C code. That goes over to a USB serial interface to the laptop on the lower left corner. Uh, that runs some Python uh, as well as a, uh, a camera driver I wrote for the microscope camera. And uh, that's able to uh, you know, take pictures from the USB camera and then send commands to the ARM processor to issue uh, step commands uh, to move the stage one bit at a time. And uh, that's how I produce the images that are later used for analysis. OK, so at this point, we were able to get some uh, top metal images of the chip, you know, the highest uh, layers. But unfortunately for this project, that, uh, showed not, that was not enough. We were looking for the ROM, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, you know, the actual firmware in this device. Uh, but we couldn't see it. You know, we could see some metal traces and a little bit below. Uh, but we had to go a little bit deeper, you know, to get the information that we're looking for. So basically, this process is called delayering. And essentially, what you're doing is removing the uh, silicon dioxide and the metal that are on those upper layers. Silicon, oxide, silicon dioxide is essentially the supporting material that holds everything together. And uh, the first thing to do is to use a hydrofluoric acid, uh, which uh, you can get through a number of uh, kind of home rust cleaner products. Don't try this at home, by the way. And, uh, and uh, you know, use that to dissolve it. Unfortunately, this had a few big problems. Uh, the first is that it's somewhat uneven, which I'll uh, talk about later causes some uh, real problems. And the second is that it leaves this aluminum fluoride residue. And that's going to deposit some gunk on the dye that's uh, going to cause some other later problems. Uh, after a little bit of researching, looking through some failure analysis books, uh, the general uh, recommendation is to use so-called buffered oxide etch. And the idea is that you add uh, um, ammonium fluoride, uh, which is, you know, a buffer. That is, you know, it keeps the pH more constant. And therefore, you know, as the acid kind of gets depleted on some parts of the chip, uh, the buffer will help kind of replenish it to the original concentration and keep it a lot more even uh, across the chip, even as some parts start to etch a little bit uh, quicker to begin with. Uh, and the second part is that I used a vortexer, which is basically a glorified mixer, and uh, kind of just shakes it around and goes into seizures. Uh, and um, also use a heat gun uh, that's temperature controlled, not, not exactly your standard Home Depot one. And uh, that way everything is very uh, temperature controlled. It's kind of sloshing around, which keeps everything well mixed. And so far that seems to give pretty good results. All right, so now we run into a little bit of a roadblock. Uh, so if you look at the top, um, what we have is a, um, we call a uh, NOR uh, imp um, a NOR active programmed ROM. That's off the uh, Motorola 68K. That's the uh, microcode. And it's very plainly visible. Basically, you can see some squiggles. And uh, essentially, you know, squiggle means one, and no squiggle means zero. And that's great, because you know, after some amount of effort, we can use CV or you know, manually type it out, whatever, and recover that into the microcode. Uh, on the bottom, though, we see the sort of equivalent structure off of this uh, CIC chip. And uh, we don't really see anything. It's kind of a blank slate. There's a little bit of dots here and there, but that's basically just, you know, dust and other garbage on the die. So at this point, we're a little bit stumped, you know. Uh, well, what can we do? So then it turns out, if you look a little bit more through some failure analysis books, uh, you find upon something called dash etch, and there's some other alternatives. But this seems to be the most standard. And this basically gets you from the image on the left under the microscope to the image on the right under the microscope. And on the right now, we have very clear, concise bits uh, that aren't too bad to uh, image. So with that in mind, let's go through this process, because although they made it sound pretty easy in the books, it turns out it's, uh, it's fairly involved to actually get good results. So first, a little bit of background. So basically what we're doing is uh, these semiconductor chips have a positive and negative doping, which is you know what actually makes these transistors work. They add small impurities like uh, boron or phosphorus uh, to the silicon in very small quantities. Now, what it turns out we can do is we use hydrofluoric acid, just like we did for delayering, to destroy the silicon dioxide. We also can use an oxidizer, such as nitric acid, 
to actually uh, turn the silicon substrate into uh, silicon dioxide. And if we use both of those at the same time, we get a competing reaction where some of the chemistry is creating silicon dioxide and some of the chemistry is taking it away. And it turns out that if you have thin layers of an optical transparent material, such as silicon dioxide, you actually get thin film interference, just like soapy bubbles. You know, you see the rainbowy colors? We're talking about, you know, the same sort of effect here. And so if we do this, uh, we actually can create crests and valleys, uh, such as the uh, SEM image that some guy named Andrew took. Uh, <laughs> I think that is the uh, Cool Runner 2. And uh, you can see uh, some areas are a little bit lower and some are a little bit higher. Uh, so, and of course, that also shows up on an optical microscope as well as a SEM. Uh, so, once again, uh, basic procedure is, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes of etching. It's actually rather quick. Um, failure analysis books recommend that you put a strong light on it, uh, like the lights that are blinding me from the audience members. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't really seen much uh, uh, changes when I've put a strong light, but that's what people recommend. Uh, unfortunately, I ran into quite a few snags, which we're going to go through. And the last unfortunate point that you'll find is because you really are etching away the chip, uh, if you don't get it right the first time, you basically lose the data. Uh, so it's definitely good to have, um, you know, kind of figure out what you're doing. So the first issue you run into is that there's process variation. And what that means is that uh, some chips are actually made, you know, smaller over time. You know, you hear about... Uh, uh, you know, 65 nanometer or, you know, 22 nanometer chips, right? You know, there's kind of this shrinking over time. Now, we're dealing at a much larger scale, but it's basically the same idea. Uh, the other part is that uh, these chip manufacturers will actually vary the uh, chemistry used. Uh, so, for example, this, you know, we generally will call the silicon dioxide. Well, it's not really that simple. You know, sometimes it's thermally grown. Sometimes it's spin on glass. You know, all these sort of variations of essentially what you're trying to get is the same uh, sort of chemistry. Uh, and that all affects, you know, the way that this is chip is going to etch and uh, give you your final product. Uh, so fortunately for this chip, uh, there are these old sports games which basically nobody loves. Uh, you know, their favorite sports guy, you know, for one year, but, you know, after 10 years, you know, no one really remembers them and they're dirt cheap on eBay. So I was able to get a big pile of these to play with and that was great because it didn't ju I didn't just have one try to get it right, you know, we can go a few rounds and iterate. So uh, the next issue that you run into is that things need to be very high purity. Uh, and I think this is one of the issues I ran into using the early, you know, hardware store chemicals was that they had, you know, different additives in there that were causing interference. Um, the picture to the right, for example, um, talk, uh, talking about interference, uh, those little uh, circles on the left and the right, I believe those are from tweezers that grab the dye and they deposited a very small amount of residue onto the dye, and that was enough to completely ruin the reaction on the dye and cause uh, lots of problems. So part of the process was finding ways, you know, to develop very high purity, basically, you know, washing a dye along instead of picking it up uh, and just keeping it, you know, no hands on it, nothing like that that would cause contamination. Uh, another issue I found was I was using the same beakers for doing the decapping as for the uh, hydrofluoric acid etching, and the problem is that nitric acid will react with copper very readily, which is, you know, present as the uh, lead frame in a lot of these chips. And uh, what this does is it uh, creates this uh, copper nitrate, which then interacts with the uh, hydrofluoric acid to cause a lot of side reactions that will kind of copper plate the dye and basically stop this reaction altogether. Uh, so use dedicated glassware and, you know, things started uh, working a lot better. Uh, another issue I ran into is, uh, you know, kind of the uh, back alley uh, chip service. I don't exactly have, you know, some sort of uh, high-tech, uh, you know, temperature or humidity control facility. Instead, I'm doing this, you know, in uh, basically in the garage, right? And so uh, wide temperature swings, you know, cold in winter, hot in summer. Uh, the main component of this dash mixture is acetic acid, you know, basically concentrated vinegar. And one of the very interesting properties about this liquid is that, or, or solid rather, is that it, uh, it melts at room temperature. So depending on how you look at it, it's either a solid or a liquid. And this becomes a real problem because uh, if it's not a hot day, this will actually precipitate, cover your dye, and actually interfere with the reaction. So the way that I get around this is actually to uh, use a heat gun, just like I was using for uh, maybe decapping or some of the delayering work, and just run it at a slightly elevated controlled temperature, 
so that regardless of whether I run this in summer or winter, you know, I get kind of a repeatable process running at about the same temperature. And uh, below you can see an example of, uh, you know, what this looks like uh, when you do it at too cold of a temperature. Uh, so even with all this, unfortunately, I still ran into a lot of problems where I would take the exact same process, or it seemed, and uh, I would actually uh, get very different results. Uh, sometimes I would get the mascarom out, and uh, sometimes I wouldn't. And, um, and uh, so after a little bit more uh, research, uh, what I found was that uh, if I lap the dye at an angle, uh, which is basically precision polishing, uh, what this will do is it will add... Um, uh, you know, kind of a, a gradient where you can see that uh, the different heights of the transistors, essentially, to see, you know, what is the optimal height that we should be operating at to get the best data retention. And what it showed was you actually want the lower layers of the transistor, which is at the right, uh, to get the ba best uh, data readout. And um, the left area of the die uh, just turned completely black. Uh, you know, there was no time when it actually showed the data. It just went immediately black, and you know, no real data could be recovered. So kind of an ongoing project is figuring out ways to kind of tune uh, you know, how far can I dig down in this die reliably to make sure that I get the uh, best data every time. Uh, and also, I get a lot of questions about safety, uh, so I thought I'd have a token slide about this. Uh, so the hydrofluoric acid is, in fact, uh, you know, not exactly the nicest chemical on the block. Uh, so for this project, I actually did purchase a, a full hazmat suit, uh, which was good because uh, I was able to work with the concentrated hydrofluoric acid, at least with, uh, you know, reasonable safety. Fortunately, I don't have to work with that very long. You basically take that, make some weaker solutions, and most of the time you just deal with those. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to hand it off to Marshall. So at this point, what we have is a bitmap of the mask ROM, which contains the program code for the microcontroller. Now, I mentioned the PIF and the SICK before. They're the two chips that are talking to each other. So here's what they actually look like once you take the lid off. SICK is on the left, PIF is on the right. They actually share the same CPU core. It is called a SM5 core CPU made by Sharp. Uh, we didn't know that at first. We just we just saw a bunch of gates. So we gave the shots to this guy named Seger, who has seen a lot of these sharp chips before, and he's a very, he's actually a sharp guy himself. Sharp <laughs> as in, like, you know, a lot of stuff up here not working for sharp. Anyway, he was immediately able to identify that uh, architecture and tell us it's an SM5. Uh, it's probably custom. There's all sorts of stuff hanging off of it that you can't immediately know what it's doing, but there you go. So that was our starting point. So, like I said, we have this down in the lower left. That's the ROM image. That is actually what the code that it executes. So, using uh, John McMaster's dash edge process, we could figure out what it looked like and then get an image. So, once we had the image, which is that big thing on the right, that's the entire mask ROM. It's eight kilobits, one kilobyte of data. Not exactly the hugest thing. It doesn't need to be. So, what I did was instead of trying to go ahead and use OpenCV to, you know, is this a zero or is it a one, scan through the entire thing. The quality was not that good. This was actually a process we started uh, in a span, like, what is it, like several months, a year, a year and a half, from when you started doing the dash edge to when you were starting to tweak it. So these early images are what I basically worked off of, and I decided I would just do everything by hand. Now, I think this is a pretty good case, or a pretty big argument for just manual entry when you just have to do something once. Like, it only took me two days to write this tool, and I slept a lot. So uh, I made it tool in C-sharp. I have a big case of not invented here, so uh, I didn't even look at a lot of the other stuff out there. There is a tool, if, if you have this same sort of problem, there's a tool out there called Rompar, uh, which is a great tool. It lets you figure out the alignment of the grid, and then, you know, sample along at different points. So if you have cleaner imagery, it's definitely something I would check out. Um, like I said, I'm Mr. Not Invented here, so I didn't use it. Um, it would probably work for you. So here's my tool. It took me half an hour once I wrote this tool just to punch in all the bits. Uh, it lets you set the grid, you know, spacing. It maxes off all the stuff that you don't need to know. It'll actually check to make sure that you typed in everything. So here's just a comparison of 
the old process versus the most recent process. John's, you know, best work is on the right. So, and that's something that you could probably automatically image, and it would be fine. Here's a block diagram of the CPU. It's a 4-bit CPU. It has 1K of ROM. It has 32 nibbles, not bytes, nibbles of RAM. So that's 16 bytes of RAM. And it has four stack levels. So no recursion. Um, not that you'd have room to do anything anyway. So once we had the architecture somewhat identified, uh, like our friend Seger indicated to us, he said, these were actually used in a lot of calculators and uh, stuff like you know handheld games from the 90s. So we were able to locate about five or six data sheets that had this uh, information in them. The problem was there was a lot of ambiguity. Uh, but I still managed to write a disassembler OK. Uh, just to give you an example, here's a few of the instructions. It's really hard to figure out what you're looking at here. Uh, the mnemonics are the same, but it has like three different uh, actions that it uh, causes. So, and I'm not good with this assembly anyway. So what I did was this middle column at the top is register transfer notation. So you can see what's going on. And then on the right is the uh, branching instructions so that I can see what's going on. So once we had this disassembly, I worked for a long time. And then that's when Mike actually came in on this project. So starting from Marshall's disassembly, we were able to get some idea of what the chip did and how it worked. But this was pretty opaque code. I'm not terribly good at reverse engineering, despite giving a talk here. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm much more of a debugger type of guy. So I wrote uh, an SM5 emulator based on these data sheets. And uh, we were actually able to uh, run a simulation of this chip uh, pretty effectively. And uh, it's a, a decent little emulator. It's got a built-in debugger, uh, code and memory breakpoints, a memory viewer and editor. Uh, right now, I'm working on undo functionality, since we know that's very important. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, actually open source. I'm going to have a link to it at the end of the talk. So having the, the disassembly from Marshall and the emulator, we were able to get an almost complete picture of how the chip actually operates. So at this point, we were able to understand the, the major phases of execution and be able to interpret some of those logic captures we got off the wire. So to give an overview of how the chip actually works, the second the console turns on, the six sends the following data to the PIF. First, it sends a hello and a region ID uh, to identify whether it's a PAL or an NTSC chip. It, it sends a, a value called a seed and a checksum. Now, the PIF looks at this data, and it decides whether it likes what it sees. At any point in this process, the PIF can decide that it's not going to allow the console to boot and just cause the console to freeze, and the SICK will just sit there waiting forever. If the PIF does like what it sees, it sends the SICK two nibbles of data to kind of precede memory, and then both chips enter the main runtime. And this is actually what it looks like on a logic analyzer. You can see the boot, the checksum, and the RAM load uh, all happen in the first second and a half or so after the console starts. And then they enter this main runtime. And this main runtime never stops. So to drill down a little bit into the boot here, you can see the hello and the region ID followed by the seed. But the seed's encoded. We'll get back to that in a little bit. This is how you actually interpret the data. So there are the, the PIF and the SICK are connected by two lines on the cartridge bus. Uh, the top line is a clock line that's driven by the PIF, and the bottom line is an open drain line that is driven uh, alternately by the PIF or the SICK. Um, it's, uh, there's no explicit bus arbitration. It's all implicit. Uh, they're running pretty similar code, so they know they won't step on each other's toes. And you can see here that uh, the encoded seed in this particular example is BD393D, and we'll talk about what that means in a second. A, a little zoom in on the checksum here. Uh, you can see that it's a bit longer than the seed. And finally, at the very end, the, you see the two nibbles sent from the PIF to the SICK. I'm out of my... All right. So the two nibbles sent from the PIF to the SICK. So this is the first time that the, the PIF actually talks to the SICK and sends any meaningful amount of data. So after it, the PIF sends those two nibbles to the SICK, they enter the main runtime mode. The, the PIF tells the SICK, uh, go into memory compare mode, and they enter memory compare mode. So at this point, we start to see similarities with the earlier SICK chips. Remember that the earlier SICK chips didn't have very much intelligence, uh, the Nintendo and the Super NES. 
uh, they had um, they were two chips that operated in lockstep, and if either chip uh, thought that there was a problem with the data stream, they'd both reset each other. In on this chip, on the PIF and the SICK, the PIF and the SICK both run the same algorithm on on the same memory, uh, but they don't do it in lockstep. Instead, they run the algorithm and then they dump the contents of memory and compare each other. So first the PIF sends its first bit of memory, then the SICK sends its first bit of memory. And on each step, first the SICK validates that the PIF has sent the correct bit, and then the PIF validates that the SICK has the correct bit. So it's, should I just use the other mic? Okay, so in, th in this case, uh, I'm gonna use the other mic. Sorry, technical difficulties. So by doing this, Nintendo not only made sure that the cartridge in the system was legitimate, they also made protected against people from trying to pirate the PIF instead of trying to pirate the SICK, so you can't have a pirate console. So this is a pretty interesting technique. And you can also see here that there's a small delay, I've highlighted it in red, when the SICK sends a zero. The first bit there is the PIF sending a zero, and you can see both the clock and the data line are driven low and high at the same time. However, the, when the six sends a bit, it waits until the data clock goes high before releasing the line. So if you were looking at some unknown chip in the future and you saw some behavior like this, you might be able to uh, deduce from this that uh, it's two chips talking at different times. Uh, finally, at the very end of this, the PIF tells the SICK to go back into the memory compare mode. So it runs this forever until you turn off the console. The party never stops. There is no delay, and if there's ever a single problem, the console locks up. Now I said that the PIF and the SICK run the same algorithm on the same code. Uh, this is what that algorithm looks like. Don't try to get your eyes crossed trying to understand it. It's just garbage. And the point here is that it's essentially security through obscurity. There's no way that you could possibly uh, deduce this algorithm realistically without decapping the chip and, and extracting the contents of the mask ROM. So it's security through obscurity, but it was effective for about 20 years, which is more than the useful life of the console. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in the win column. So we mentioned earlier that there are several variants of the SICK. Uh, one of them in particular, the 6105, had a special extra mode just to try to foil the pir pirates a little bit more. Uh, in this mode, the game could actually query the SICK, send it a challenge, and the SICK would send a response. And this is what the code looks like inside the SICK for doing that. It's just another case of security through obscurity. What's interesting to note about this is that uh, a gentleman by the name of Xscale actually was able to take a huge pile of data, because we can log this data, and he was able to reverse engineer the actual algorithm used to generate this without looking at the code. So that was very, very impressive. So at this point in the process, we had the disassembler, we had the emulator, we could get a pretty good interpretation of the data coming over the lines. We still couldn't completely clone the chip. We had a few more hangups. Uh, one example here is that the data sh sheets were not the best data sheets. Uh, they had some, some, uh, some incompatibilities. For example, you can see in the top one the, the uh, skip if BL equals zero, and in the second one, skip if result of BL equals FH. So depending on how you implemented these instructions, you could have very drastically different code paths. And now the other thing is, we had this encoded seed in this encoded checksum. So with these data sheets, there was, an, uh, there was an opcode called DTA, and depending on which data sheet you were looking at, it did something different. For example, in one of the chips, it would drive LCD drivers. In another chip, it would drive analog digital converters. So it seemed to be just sort of a general purpose instruction used to do a chip specific function. And in this case, we had no idea what this chip specific function was. However, we could definitely tell looking at the code that it was related to this encoded seed and this encoded checksum. It was loading some data from somewhere and then that data ended up in memory. Then this encoding process happened and that data got sent over the wire. Interestingly enough, we looked at this encoding algorithm and I said, hey, it looks like you could probably run that in reverse. So 
we came up with the inverse algorithm for this, and then based on that data sent over the, the wire, we could actually decode it and get the contents of that secret data without actually having to understand how this instruction worked. So in the first example, you'd see one chip, when it boots, it sends BD393D, and when you decode it, you get 3F3F. That's the seed for that particular chip. The next example, the seed is 7878. Interestingly enough, when the, the system boots, this encryption key, the first two bytes there, or the first two nibbles, rather, are always B5. The checksum's a little bit more interesting. It's longer for one thing, and then it uses a four nibble quote unquote key. And this value actually varies depending on a delay from the PIF. There's a random period of time that the PIF waits before telling the SICK, okay, send me the checksum. And that is just based off of the uh, RC circuit delay from a uh, capacitor that hangs off of this chip. So finally, with all of this, we actually were able to completely clone the chip. So in order to test this, we, I had this guy over here who's an Altium Pro put together a PCB. Do you want to talk about the PCB, Marshall? Yeah, uh, as you can see, I am a uh, total PCB expert. Uh, all it does is it uh, adapts about four pins from the SIC footprint to the, uh, we used a PIC microcontroller, uh, it's a PIC 16F something or other. Uh, so as you can see, that PCB is very, very compliant to everything. <laughs> Uh, so if you use, you know, ROHS or a lead free solder, you're fine. Uh, you're compliant for all cases. So anyway, uh, that was our, uh, basically our test bed for uh, the first, first few chips. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and run a video of this thing booting and apologize in advance. The video quality is not the best. I looked around my house for anything that accepted composite in that didn't, wasn't also mounted to a wall. And this studio monitor is the best I could come up with. So... Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do here is boot Banjo Tui, and as you can see, uh, the game actually successfully boots. And this is one of those games that uses the 6105 chip. Uh, it won't even get, it won't even boot if you haven't implemented the 6105 challenge response algorithm correctly. Actually, this game uh, it encrypts all of its game assets, and it uses the response as a decryption key, so it decrypts itself at runtime. So uh, the way they actually emulate this on a computer is to just capture all the responses as someone plays through the entire game, because there are over several hundred responses that you have to know. Actually, an interesting side note about that. After Xscale uh, was able to reverse engineer this algorithm, he, he gen re regenerated the, the list of all the challenges and responses, and it turned out that this, there was a, somebody fat-fingered one of the, the responses in the, uh, in the file. So. So after uh, Banjo Tui boots, so uh, we just had a guy by name of Arbin play through this game 100%, and he just finished playing it 100% last night, and he did not run into any problems whatsoever. So we're very confident that our sick clone is working 100% effectively. So after that game finishes, uh, oh, interesting, it does have sound. <laughs> so just for completeness, we also went ahead and booted an, another game with another sick. Uh, this is using our our uh, little adapter board that I can show you after the talk. Um, this is just booting Star Fox. And again, I've left this game running overnight and it never stops and never, never seems to cause any problems. So we're, we're pretty confident in, uh, in our code. Oops, that looks close enough. I'm bad at computers, sorry guys. If I hit Control Q, is it gonna quit PowerPoint? Sorry, I've only been a Mac user for, uh, for a couple of weeks now. Marshall, tell a joke. <laughs> Putting me on the spot here, wow. Well, uh, I see a joke on the stage here. <laughs> Ooh, wow. <laughs> I was gonna buy you a beer, but nope. It's all right, he can take it. <laughs> All right, so um, that was our, our demo. Uh, I wasn't going to lug a Nintendo 64 from the States here to show it, but uh, in any case, really? Really? All right, in any case, so uh, 
Some of the features of our, our clone ship is that it's actually region free. I discovered a technique for making it able to boot in either the PAL or the NTSC region. Uh, I'm not releasing that code, but I am releasing a bare bones version of this code uh, open source. So uh, there's going to be a GitHub link at the end. If you want to check out my really awesome 8 bit pick assembly, go, go nuts, man. I never want to look at that architecture again. Fun, <laughs> funny thing about pick, it's pretty terrible. Uh, but for this particular microarchitecture, it had some nice features that made uh, implementing this stuff pretty e easier than it could have been otherwise. Remember we mentioned that this is a 4-bit microcontroller? So when you've got things like, uh, like carry, uh, it all depends on not carry in the 8th bit, it's carry in the 4th bit. PIC actually has a feature called decimal carry. So if the 4th bit carries, there's a flag in the status register. So we were able to actually implement the code in a pretty straightforward manner, not having to think too hard about 4-bit math versus 8-bit math. We ran into an interesting problem with a PIF. So the, the CPU clock for the SICK is around 1.6 to 2 megahertz, and the internal logic of the chip actually runs at half that speed. So we wired up a PIC to the same clock, and we thought, great, we're going to have twice as many instructions uh, to actually implement the same thing because we'll, have, uh, we'll be running at the full external clock speed. A well, fun fact about 8-bit picks, they actually run at one-fourth the external clock speed. So we had half as many instructions. That didn't work out. Uh, luckily, Microchip makes a pin-compatible part to the one we originally spec'd, and uh, it has an internal 4x PLL. So we were able to get around that. So I guess you win some, you lose some with, uh, with pick. All right, last but not least, we, I definitely want to mention some related work. We spent about two, two and a half years working on this, and in the meantime, at least one other independent effort came about to reverse engineer this chip. Uh, so uh, a German team led by two guys named Marcus uh, uh, wrote a paper called this, uh, Breaking this Integrated Circuit Device Security, yada, yada. Uh, they found a factory test mode on this chip. They, uh, they they, like we did, they decapped the chip and optically imaged it. They traced out some of the logic on the chip and found that there was actually a factory test mode. And so they found that they were actually able to perform arbitrary code execution on this chip. And uh, so using, using their technique, we could actually start to understand what some of these un unknown instructions did and, uh, and, and run some code on the chip. So once again, uh, PCB Pro over here made us a board. It's a very nice board. I like it. I made it last year, so it's not that out of date anymore. <laughs> and so uh, this, this board has a footprint for a SICK on here and also has the ability to burn picks. It slices. It dices. And so this was uh, plugs into an FPGA board there, and we were able to clock some code uh, into it and run arbitrary code. Uh, using this technique, we were able to uh, extract the mask ROM using uh, code and validate that our image that we have obtained optically was bit for bit identical to the uh, the image, and it turns out it was. So that was really great to find out that our technique was was very effective. So one of the th other things I'm working on that's also related to Nintendo 64 is uh, an HDMI converter that you know, upscales the signal. So I needed a way to be able to update the firmware for that in the field. So I thought, okay, you just make yourself a custom game. You put in the Nintendo, it boots, and then it reflashes everything. So this was this is one of the biggest use cases that I can see right off for this uh, sick clone chip is that you just put on there, it costs like 70 cents, and then you can make like scads of these things and not have to worry about getting them back. So you're not dependent on, you know, scavenging stuff from older games. So we'll talk a little bit about the future work. Uh, we also, uh, John decapped and imaged the PIF, the more advanced chip that lives on the Nintendo 64, and uh, we, we traced out, John traced out some of the logic on that chip and found the same two test pins that Marcus and Marcus had identified. So we strongly suspect that the internal test mode is present on this chip. Uh, we did extract the die image, uh, the ROM image optically, but uh, when we tried to interpret it, we ran into some weird problems. So uh, I think for a future work, we're going to try to identify the bus that uh, that actually you clock the data in and out. So this was some stuff that you did, Marshall. Right. I took the die image that uh, John made, and I went around the periphery of the chip where the inputs and outputs are, and I tried to catalog what nets were driving what pins, and it turns out... <laughs> 
some pins were only driven or drove one net, which a net is basically a signal. So around the, this, uh, the uh, outside, the periphery of the uh, chip there, you see the pin number, the function of the chip, and then this blue number. And the blue number is the number of nets that that uh, I.O. driver has. So if you look at the top right corner, you'll see, you know, 666, 36364. Uh, and then the, those are a lot higher than the ones on the bottom left. So I'm thinking that these uh, pins have alternate functionality, just like the SICK, and that we you can use them for arbitrary code execution. Now, this is future work. We, you know, we just discovered this like a week ago. So, but we're really hoping we could run our own code on this chip. This uh, has its own 1K ROM as well, but it's actually fully utilized, unlike the SICK that is basically half empty. So... So, yeah, we have some interesting ideas about how we might find those pins. So if you want to talk to us after the talk about that, we'd be happy to. Uh, that's pretty much all we got for you today. Uh, give out some thanks. Marcus and Marcus very graciously helped us out. Um, Seger, who is crazy smart, Zonkity as well, helped a lot on this project. I think nobody knows more about how the Nintendo 64 boots than he does. Uh, MU Kitted out in Australia helped a lot with the PAL testing. Arbin and Jura, who are running through games, and uh, making sure that they continue running so that when we release this to the public, they will be solid as a rock. Uh, shout outs to some friends on the internet N64Dev, Pinchy, Lack, Xscale, Nico Jovis, rest in peace. Andrew, thanks for, uh, thanks for everything. <laughs> and with that, we'll open it up to any questions. And these are our uh, contacts and stuff. Awesome talk, you guys. Um, hey, you can't see me, but I'm going to ask you a question. So the, um, from what I understand, the NES SICK had this hack that you could lift one of the pins and just ground it, and that would disable the SICK in the console. So any game, you know, any pirated games, you could just run on it. Did you notice anything with the N64 SICK, either by looking through the code or like figuring out something else, that it, it, an easier way to bypass this whole thing if you could you know, modify the console? Well, like I said, the PIF is what you got to worry about, and it, it lives inside the console, and it does all the system bring up, and it does handle all the resets and NMIs for the MIP CPU, and it pulls the controllers and all that stuff. So basically, yeah, you can blow that away and replace it with your own. Uh, you'll have to lift some copyrighted code uh, bootloader out of there, put it in your new one, and then replicate all this it's, functionality. It's not a practical approach, but if we get the PIF code, maybe there's a, a hidden mode where the SICK can tell it, hey, just stop bugging me and, and let it run forever. Is this off now? Is this on? Yeah, technical difficulties here, too. Okay, so really they're, they're almost solving that problem just by hiding it inside of more silicon. They're hiding it inside much more complex silicon. Yeah. Any other questions? Over there. Take a moment to say that I really enjoy video games. Hey, so when you guys approached the dash etching for the PIF and SICK, you guys had a bunch of cartridges that you can just buy for 50, or 50 cents each. But how did you approach uh, dash etching the chip in the console where you only had like a couple of them? Or did you guys just sacrifice like 20 and 64s? So at so at that point, uh, I had already developed the process for the uh, 6102, and the process on the PIF was very similar. So I was able to just say, okay, look, these chips are made on the same process. It's going to require the same recipe. Uh, so it really wasn't that big of a deal to get the uh, process working on the PIF once it was working on the SICK. I think we have more questions here in the front. So I hand over here. It's a miracle I can see anything up here. Oh, hi. Uh, so the modern EverDrive's boot, how does that work? And are you going to share this stuff with the EverDrive guy? So all, so the, the clone of the SICK is open source. So if he wants to use that, he can. Uh, the, currently, as far as I know, they're, they're using the, the, just the same, same technique that the 64 drive uses, which is a cop, an actual chip inside the console, or a, original a Nintendo SICK. So... All right. I, uh, any more questions? We got one more. Oh, I think this is the most questions I've ever gotten from a talk. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a little bit of a last minute question. Um, I know the old CIC had like an unusual four bit polynomial instruction counter. I was curious if there were any hardware quirks of the N64 or CIC that are similar. Uh, aside from just being a four bit microcontroller, it was pretty vanilla. It had a regular linear counter, uh, nothing all that out of the ordinary. Yeah, because uh, I've seen the reversing efforts for the previous CIC, but I was always curious how they had, uh, you know, manually reversed that polynomial instruction counter and gone through the code for reversing. That that's that's a hundred percent Seger. He's he's one of those those people who you just like. All right, you're crazy smart. Just just take this and do your thing. All right, I think that's it. <laughs>